I remember like Nicolas Cage when I was uh, when I was working with him in Face Off, and we for a while we were really really close friends. We spent like five years, we flew to Hawaii together, and rode motorcycles around the island. And we we spent we had a a real spell before I met Emily that was um, uh, from the time that I filmed Face Off until meeting her that was. Uh, where we were kind of inseparable. And I always remember him saying like, ah, Alessandro, who do you want to be, man? You know, and like, I was like, I never had an answer for that. Hey, it's Kara, and you're watching Really Famous, where you get to know your favorite celebrities on a truly intimate level because I was a therapist and that's how I roll. Right now, you are about to get to know Alessandro Nivola, who stars as Dickie Moltisanti in the new Sopranos prequel, The Many Saints of Newark. So you know him as Dickie, but do you know what lies under the surface? of Alessandro, you're about to find out. Let's do it. I wanna send you a message from somebody else. I was talking to um, Michael Imperioli last night. Oh, were you? I was. And... You've interviewed him before, right? I think okay. I noticed on your, on your site. Yeah, he is, he has been a great friend to me and my show over the years. So, so yes, he's definitely been on the show a bunch of times and uh, he's a good guy. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I don't know him well, but we met before uh, I started filming the movie. After I'd been cast, but we hadn't, I hadn't started. And um, he was just so nice. I remember him saying before I even started, you know, you're going to be great in this and like just incredibly uh, generous soul. And um and then since having seen the movie, he's just been, uh, uh, you know, very vocal about um, my performance in it and stuff. And so I, I, I'm really touched by that because obviously, well, for me, apart, apart from the show, I, I, I was just a huge admirer of him as an actor. I think he's um, a truly great actor and uh, the best kind of actor and and then his authenticity in that role which of course is my son i mean i'm playing his father in the in the movie um it's just so kind of impressive and it's just so real and funny and and unpredictable and and uh so it meant you know i i really was hoping for his approval uh as much as anybody so to hear that from him was was a a relief and and very uh exciting for me okay well i'll tell you what he said to me last night when i told him i was talking to you today he said he's gonna win the oscar <laughs> he's out of his freaking mind that's what he said uh, i wish he were i wish he were the one to determine that <laughs> <laughs> and I think he's a, he could be the perfect judge to determine that. Why not? It should be Michael. Tell him, Perry Michael. Really says. You tell him. <laughs> so um, I asked him, I said, is it okay? Can I tell him that you said that? He said, absolutely. So that is what he said. And well, I'm going to do his, I'm, I'm going to do his, um, his Talking Sopranos uh, podcast on Monday, I think it is. So, cool. Uh, That's awesome. Tell him that, um, that I met his, you. That's big too, that podcast, it got so big. It's funny when I first had him on my podcast and when I, mine was just a podcast, he was, yeah. I was basically teaching him about podcasts, like about how to listen to them in the car. You know, he's like, yeah. I listen to NPR in the car. I don't know what you're talking little about. Little boy, let me just tell you how to do this. <laughs> Yes. It's not that hard. Right. <laughs> and now he's got like the biggest podcast practically, you know, one of the biggest podcasts there are, the Sopranos one. So <laughs> that's very cool. Um, I, yeah, tell him that I said hi back. All right, I will. I will. And uh, yeah, Tim Daly also he had on recently who was also on the Sopranos. And right. Tim yeah, has been on my show a bunch of times too. He's a good guy too. Um, what about Ray Liotta? I saw he's in it. and. He's amazing. He, I've been trying to get him on my show, by the way, for like years. I'm fascinated by him. How was he? Uh, he was, um, you know, he's an eccentric guy. I, of, you know, of everybody involved, he was the person I was probably most intimidated by and 
and most wanted to impress both because of his kind of, you know, he's part of mob movie royalty. Uh, I mean, his performance in Goodfellas is one of the, one of the greats. And then also because he was the only person in the whole group of our cast who was actually from New Jersey, from an Italian family in New Jersey and like had really kind of, um, grown up in the kind in in the world of the of the movie not that he'd grown up as a as a you know part of a organized crime or anything like that but that you know that he he lived in that part of the world and and in that kind of um, uh, culture and and so you know of everybody he was the person i was most shy about feeling like that that uh, he I was most frightened of him thinking that I was an imposter somehow. Yeah, yeah. And um, and he's kind of inscrutable. He's very, very committed as an actor. And I think he has like real respect and fascination for acting and for the process of people's work on ca- character work. and. Um, I felt him in the early days of of our working together really kind of um, fi- fixing on me and he has you know an intense stare and I just felt him watching me and I just I knew he was kind of trying to assess whether you know this was going to work and and if I uh, you know was was um, going to be able to deliver or not and and then I got a text from him uh, a couple of weeks in where he, he said that, uh, you know, something, I, I can't remember exactly how it went. It's something like, you know, great work today. You reminded me of myself as Henry Hill. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the moment that I felt like, okay, I'm onto something here. And um, uh, it really like just, gave me a huge confidence boost to, to hear that from him. And then, and then I lost my phone and something got screwed up with the iCloud and that text was forever lost. Oh. <laughs> but maybe I dreamt it, maybe it didn't really happen. No, it happened. That stinks. So <laughs> we're, all, we're all liars, right? <laughs> yeah. No one will ever know. You have to screenshot those things like the second they happen so that you know, <laughs> boom, I've got that forever. I know. Uh, I know. I feel like maybe I sent it to my agents or something. I got to call them up and see if they Yeah. <laughs> but that, I can imagine that totally propels you at that point. If you have that imposter syndrome you're dealing with, which everybody does, of course, but if that, that was at the beginning of when you were shooting, so that took you forward. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it always like those first days. Uh, on the set are always the most kind of delicate and uh, scary because you just are, uh, you know, you've created this whole, you've created the character in your own imagination and everything, but having to have it, to, to interact with other people and what these relationships are, are like, it, it can, it, it can, can expose it as something that is really working or or not and um yeah so the right in those early days i i i definitely needed something like that yeah i mean you can't ask for anything better than that honestly if you could dream up one thing to say or one thing that some person would say to you at the beginning of taping that would be it although i did also read what david chase said about you that he had his eye on you. Can I read it? I wrote it down. I think this was in the Rolling Stone feature. I mean, you probably read uh, okay. it. Okay. Uh, I, I haven't read it yet, so I'm not okay. sure. I'm, I'm I'm scared to hear what this Don't is. don't be scared. This is all, right. all good. So David okay. Chase said, "I remember Alessandro from American Hustle and the Most Violent Year." Says Chase. I always thought he was great and he's Italian. I thought, where has this guy been? Why doesn't he get jobs? And I decided to get him a job. That's, I mean, come on people. So now you have Ray Liotta and David Chase, like what's- Well, it was, you know, the the cool thing about this, this whole movie was such an unlikely 
thing. I see the, the I, I kind of see the movie as like a, a Trojan horse where um, these kind of movies aren't made anymore, really. Like a kind of mid-level studio drama. Um, these are movies that were made up through the 80s and into the 90s and then it doesn't happen anymore. I mean, all the studio movies are now franchise stuff. And so they they occasionally pick up stuff at film festivals and distribute them, but they, they don't they don't finance and make these kinds of movies. And it only happened because of the the branding of the show. And uh, and then on top of that, I, you know, I would never have been I, I, I would never have the studio would never have allowed me to play this part if it hadn't been for the fact that they were selling the movie off of the notoriety of the show, as opposed to off of the name value of its lead actor. And, um, and that was what allowed David Chase and Alan Taylor to cast whoever they want. And if it hadn't been for the, for, for that, uh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have allowed them to cast me. So, um, you know, it, it really was like such a, a one in a million kind of situation. They're just like, if you look at the slates of all the studio movies, there's just nothing like this on there. Yeah. And it, it's, it was like snuck in under the guise of being a, you know, spin-off or whatever of, of a well-branded IP. And, and in fact, it's a, it, it's a really kind of classic kind of movie um, that, that isn't made by the studios anymore. Right. Right. And we're all lucky that it's, that it got made. Like, thank God for that. Right. I mean, I'm yeah. glad about that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like I, I, I couldn't believe even that I had the opportunity to, audition for it when when it came up because um these kinds of as i said like they just don't make these movies right. anymore so, i mean they make them independently but then there's a whole other set of problems you know they, they then the the audience that they're geared toward is much smaller and more niche and um they uh you don't have any guarantee of of them being picked up and well distributed and they, there's often not enough yeah. money to give it the kind of production value that this movie had and I mean I've been down this road so many times okay. I, I think I've st I've counted I think 12 movies that I've starred in over the course of my career that never even got released are you kidding 12 <laughs> never even got released what where are they I mean I, well here I'll get up my IMDB page and I'll tell you I'll read them out and uh, and uh, we'll you'll see if you've ever heard of these things they okay. you can because they never and and these were like big starring roles you know that I'd spent months preparing for and often that I'm really proud of my work in and stuff and just never okay so it started with uh, a movie that I starred in opposite Rachel Vice in 1998 called I Want You. This was after Face Off, I'd done Face Off. Um, and this was my next movie and it was directed by Michael Winterbottom who is a great English director and has done a lot of, you know, movies that have made a splash, 24 hour party people, um, Sarajevo, Welcome to Sarajevo, uh, um, that thing with uh, The Trip, um, anyway, he made this movie called I Want You that I was the lead role in, never got released. Okay, that's the first one. So it was then, filmed and everything? It was completed? Yeah. Oh. We, we made it. I think it came out in England on one screen or something, and, and that was it. Never came out in America. Uh, then Reach the Rock was a John Hughes movie that I made in that I was the lead role in, and also in 1998, never came out. Never Wait, well, how could a John Hughes movie not come out? It was directed by his protege, this young guy, um, and it, he had written it and pr produced it, and oh. it just didn't get a distribution. Um, 
then uh, let's see here, Carolina. Uh, I starred starring role, romantic comedy, me and Julia Stiles um, with uh, Shirley MacLaine in it. Never got released in 2003. Um, then uh, a movie called The Sisters uh, that I was in with uh, Chris O'Donnell and Maria Bello and various other people, 2005, never got released. Turning Green, an Irish movie, Irish gangster movie that I starred in with Timothy Hutton, never got released, 2005. Um, uh, the Girl in the Park that I starred in with Sigourney Weaver. I don't think that ever got released, 2007. Um, $5 a Day, me and Chris Walken with Sharon Stone in a supporting role, never got released in 2008. Who Do You Love? Uh, uh, me and David Oyelowo playing Leonard Chess and uh, Muddy Waters, uh, never got released. Um, uh, I guess that might be <laughs> the last of it. Let me see. Oh, uh, this movie, Day Out of Days, that um, uh, Zoe Castavetti's directed, uh, 2015, never got released. 1% More Humid, uh, me and Juno Temple, and I won the Best Actor Award at the Tribeca Film Festival the year that it came out, and it never got released. That was 2017. <laughs> Um, Are you kidding? Uh, and that is the last of it. That's so maybe now they'll get them all out of like limbo or whatever. And after this, <laughs> after your Oscar win, then yeah. everybody's gonna be like, oh, we have to get these distributed. Let's get we have them. They're in the can on the shelf. Let's get Some them. Some of them were them. like at film festivals, do you know what I mean? And got uh, well reviewed and still never got picked up. You know? Well, it's not about that. It's not always about the quality, right? It's about the marketing and distribution. Like that's everything. Yeah, and the whole things process about. of film, you know, independent movies being bought at film festivals is a very like, it's this like weird dance where you get there and uh, so much depends on the timing of when the movie screens and you know what the atmosphere and the room is there and which buyers are there and whether yeah. there's, the, aware of interest from another buyer or not and so much about like which movies get picked up is to do with like does the, is there like a collective decision that they're going to sort of bid against each other and you know it's really like terrifying and and you can just slip through the cracks there and then it's done going back to the sopranos have you had any interesting interactions with the original cast i mean you just talked about michael and of course, we know about Ray Liotta, not the original cast, but anybody from the original who you've had an interesting something? No, with? I mean, I, I apart from Michael um, Imperioli, I, I I haven't had any, I haven't met any of them. I haven't had any contact or communication with any of them. Um, and that's all going to happen, I think. I don't know. They were going to, they were planning a screening on the, on the, uh, in, a, in a week or so where they brought our cast together with the original cast. Oh, no, I did meet Tony Sirico. He came to the set once. He was a character, but he's very, very old now. So, um, you know, yeah. he was almost unrecognizable from, from being really? on the show. <clears throat> um, yeah, he's not well, to be honest. He's, um, he's, he's had some, you know, physical problems. And, so he's pretty fragile, um, but I haven't really, um, uh, I haven't really met anybody else. I'm going to meet uh, Sharipa on the podcast on on Monday, and uh, along with Michael again. And um, but even Michael and I, we're, we're we're planning to get together next week and go and and have a coffee together, uh, which will really be the first time that's happened. I mean, we we met uh, at a screening uh, about a couple months before we started shooting and uh just said a, a few words to each other but um and among those words was like we got to get together <laughs> and uh and it never happened never. just filming never. covid and 
<clears throat> um, so hopefully we're gonna we're gonna do that uh, in New York before he ha he's heading off to Italy. I think for his like twenty fifth year anniversary. Yeah, he's the real deal, and I think it is gonna happen. You're gonna get together. You're gonna have coffee, and you're both like you're both very artsy i feel like you know you're both artists for sure and you're you you both really analyze filmmaking and acting and all of it and i mean he's an artist on so many levels you know he's a yeah. musician too and yeah we have that in common too like i i play a lot of instruments and i used to play in bands and i've done a lot of roles where i've had to do recording and stuff and and uh you know yeah he's a big like rock you know uh fanatic and he's into sort of like he was really into dinosaur jr and the guy one of the lou barlow who plays with them played in my band for in the film laurel canyon uh and then he's really into warren ellis who who is uh you know plays with nick cave and then and my brother-in-law emily's sister's husband george majestica is the guitar player for the nick cave and the bad seeds and plays with warren and so we'll, i'm looking forward to getting into some of that with him yeah, I see a connection for sure. Um, so get, to, get together, have that coffee, and then it'll keep going after that. What is the image that people generally have of you? Like, who do they think you are? And who are you really? Um, God, I have no idea what people's image of me is. I really don't. Um, and my, who am I is like an even harder question. I mean, I think that really like I, uh, I became an actor because I, I always have felt more kind of comfortable and confident and, and in my own skin when I was, uh, when I'd create, when I'd invented a character for myself and, and, um, short of that like i've always felt just a little bit sort of like i remember like nicholas cage when i was a when i was working with him in face off and we for a while we were really really close friends we spent like five years we, you know flew to hawaii together and rode motorcycles around the island and we we, spent, we had a, a real spell before i met emily that was um uh from the time that i filmed face off until meeting her that was uh where we were kind of inseparable and I always remember him saying like, ah, Alessandro, who do you want to be, man? You know, and like, I was like, I never had an answer for that. Like I never, I never really had a kind of clear sense of, of who I wanted to be. I, I really just wanted to like disappear in, in roles. And, um, and he was kind of baffled by that. And, and that probably was why, you know, it was a sort of slower trajectory for me as an actor, because I just didn't like um, define myself clearly to the world in that way. That's so interesting. Who do you, so it's interesting that he said that too, because he definitely decided who he wants to be. Yeah. And it's interesting, I, I think you have disappeared into your roles and that's, that's a critical ingredient, I think, and it makes you, it gives you the ability, I guess, to come out so strongly in all the different roles. So do you talk to him anymore, Nicolas Cage? Uh, the last I saw him, I was at the Toronto Film Festival for Disobedience a few years ago. And um, and I ran into him. Uh, we were both doing press in different rooms or something. And I ran into him in the hallway and I was like, oh, man, how you been? You know, it's been so long. And he was like, oh, how you doing? You know, and, and uh, I was like, listen, my screening is tonight. Like, why don't you just come and, and, and maybe we can, you know, hang out after or something. And he was like, yeah, I'll try or whatever, you know? And I just thought like, he's never gonna come, whatever, you know? So I, I and then I forgot about it. And I just, I, I did the press line for the screening and I, I sat down in my seat and boom, like he just plops down right next to me. He's got like a huge cowboy hat on and like a, snakeskin jacket and cowboy boots and like boom he sat down watched the the movie the the the, the lights came up uh and he like said something sweet like leaned over and was like ah oh, another astonishing performance and then like he got up and left and i haven't seen him since then <laughs> that, that's almost perfect 
That's perfect. <laughs> that is so great. Okay. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for being on the show. My um, pleasure. I My hope pleasure. I didn't ruin you for like all the other things. I talked to you too long. I asked you too many questions and now no, you're right at the no, beginning of it. No, it's all good. I'm still like, I haven't yet, uh, I haven't been exhausted yet by this process. If I see you in a month, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it'll be a different story, but uh, no, now it's all good. That was Alessandra Nivola. I hope you enjoyed this talk. If you did, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to tap on that subscribe button so you're notified every time I drop a new video, which is usually twice a week on Sundays and Fridays. If you like this talk, you'll probably like the talks that I mentioned in the show. My talks with Michael Imperioli and Tim Daly, Talia Shire. You can definitely watch all of them too. You may just have to search for them on my channel, which of course is called Really Famous. Um, so if you have thoughts about this talk, if you have thoughts about the show, thoughts about The Sopranos, anything, drop a comment. I do read them. I like to know what you're thinking and uh, what you think of the show. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.